here. Um, I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board and the joint meeting of the City Council and the uh, James City County Supervisors to order. And uh, before I ask Ms. Starr to call the roll for the school board, just want to take a moment to thank everybody for spending this morning, St. Patrick's Day morning, with with us. This was one of those uh, mornings every year that I dreaded because I never saw it coming. I was not good at calendars, and I'd show up to school as an elementary school student without my green, and I'd have to learn my lesson every year for five years. So my heart goes out to those students. That every day. Um, the star, uh, I, I don't know where you are. Oh, there you are, Ms. Star. Would you call the roll for the school board, please? Dr. Beers? Here. Ms. Donner? Here. Ms. Hummel? Here. Ms. Hundley? Here. Ms. Ortego? Here. Ms. Young? Here. Mr. Dow? Here. Uh, Mayor Ponce? Good morning and welcome into the city, the Stryker Center. The space that you're in is managed, uh, kind of in, managed by the library staff. So this is part of the library space, and so glad to have you all here. Um, Ms. McCoy, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Rogers? Here. Ms. Carnshear? Here. Ms. Ramsey? Here. Vice Mayor Dent? Here. Mayor Ponce? Here. And uh, Mayor, uh, Chairman, Chairman, excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead and call the meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors order. Would you call the roll, please, sir? Sir, Ms. Sadler? Here. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. McLennan? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. Hipple? Here. All present. All present. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, before I turn this time over to Dr. Heron for her uh, recommended uh, superintendent's budget, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you, Mayor Pons, for, for the venue here. Thank uh, all of those leaders uh, that are present here for your steadfast support of our school division, our, uh, the work that's being done even right now by some really fantastic teachers and faculty and staff. I want to thank uh, members of the community that are here, uh, your constant and fervent engagement. Uh, it, it doesn't go without notice. Uh, speaking of parents and teachers and other community members in the room. Um, and just briefly, I had an opportunity early this week with uh, Vice Chair Ortego to visit one of our schools, our elementary school, Laura Lane. Just wanted to offer a real brief report on that, um, just as a, 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 to show the significance of these meetings and uh, the value that they have. We saw some incredible things happening. Uh, we, we were privileged to have uh, the better part of an hour to spend, which was a lot of time for Dr. Swan, who was very busy, elementary school principal, uh, spent the better part of an hour with us touring uh, Laura Lane and showing us um, classrooms and the gymnasium PE was going on. And there are a lot of great takeaways that I know that aren't just, um, they aren't just significant to Laura Lane, but that we can see those things happening across the division. Um, uh, Significant. Uh, one of the significant things that I saw was as we walked into a many of the classrooms, even the gymnasium, um, students were focused. There was rigorous learning. Uh, we'd walk in and it's like we weren't even there. Uh, never had an opportunity to speak. Um, teachers were focused. Students were focused. Um, and it really was heartening to see that learning was taking place in a really significant way. Uh, there was a clear sense of belonging among students, uh, students and staff. I would, I would see um, custodial staff giving high fives to our students, um, calling them by, by name, um, really clear sense of belonging that was really heartening as well. Safety and security uh, was paramount in this school. Um, we, uh, as a division, with the leadership of our superintendent, have made the same priority for all of our schools, all 16 schools, the central office staff. Um, and to see that happening at an elementary school uh, on a day that we really kind of had free reign. It wasn't just in and out. Like I said, we were there for an hour, so things could happen. We could see some things. And we saw students walking in pairs to the restroom, to the nurse's office. Um, there was respect for faculty and staff. It was just a wonderful thing to see. And then finally, one of my big takeaways that I want to share with you is that we got to see uh, two um, of several, but two, of our future learners in action, uh, excuse me, future educators, excuse me, future educators in action, um, student teachers. And, um, this happened to be, I think, the first week that they were taking uh, full ownership of the classroom, having been um, student teachers. And uh, they had just jumped right in. They knew the students by name. Um, they were leading like they had been born for this job. 
happen. So I just want to share that with this body as a report to, to share that these meetings matter, um, the work that and the, the discussions, deliberations that take place here and in other meetings, um, they have real consequences. Uh, and uh, the success that we are seeing now in the school division is in large part to the work that takes place here in the conversation. So I just want to share with that with you and thank you for your continued leadership as well. And Dr. Heron, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, uh, Chair Hippel, members of the Board of Supervisors, Mayor Pons, the Council members and school board members. Uh, before I start this morning, happy St. Patrick's Day to all. Uh, hopefully it means something to come up with this accent. Um, <laughs> we're delighted to be with you this morning to present the superintendent's proposed fiscal year tw 2024 budget. Every year we come together in this setting to discuss our investment in our schools and by extension our community. Your generous support <coughs> over the years has been the foundation for our continued excellence and your continued investment in public education demonstrates commitment to our children and the future of our community. In our presentation today, you will see the largest funding, funding request that has been brought before our funding partners in recent memory. This proposal comes to you after several months of working to present the minimum necessary investment to ensure we can sustain the current level of instructional programming and operations. For illustrative purposes, our calculations initially would have resulted in a, in a request of 16 million from the localities. We've spent many months reviewing data, looking at every dollar to bring you today a pivotal budget of need. Ms. Ewan will reference some of the reductions already made in her presentation this morning. The fiscal year 24 proposed budget is aligned with the goals of the strategic plan, Elevate Beyond Excellence and prioritizes teaching and learning, safety and security, and employee compensation. As you know, our greatest resource is in WJCC schools is our people. Therefore, our number one priority is retaining our excellent, dedicated employees and attracting new employees to the school division. <laughs> Teachers, administrators, support employees all contribute to a positive environment that makes it possible for every student to learn. Over the last two years, we have worked together to begin to restore the level of compensation for our staff to remain competitive with our neighbours. To continue this work, the largest proposed increase in this budget is $10.9 million for salaries. If we are to attract and retain the best employees in a highly competitive market and have our classrooms and other positions fully staffed, the first day of school is, is paramount. As you well know, investment in schools and investment in staff, 81% of whom live right here in our community, is an investment in our community. This is a budget of need, and with full funding, we will be able to meet the essential needs of over 11,300 students and appropriately compensate and retain our 2,000 employees. As UN Chief Financial Officer will now join me in presenting the proposed fiscal year 24 budget, Ms. Ewing. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good morning, everyone. Today, we will be sharing the superintendent's modified proposed budget for fiscal year 2024. This budget is based on Governor Yunkin's proposed amendments to the state budget for 2024, so the state revenue information is likely to change once the General Assembly adopts a final budget. As you know, state code requires the superintendent to prepare a needs-based budget to present to the school board for consideration. This is a data-driven estimate of what is required to provide the highest quality education possible to the children of our community. Considerable work has gone into developing the superintendent's proposed budget with the process beginning in October until the presentation of the superintendent's proposed budget in February. This fiscal year 24 plan is a balance of meeting established school board priorities related to the strategic plan, elevate beyond excellence, a review of available revenue, and meeting increased student and division needs for the upcoming fiscal year. We are thankful for both the leadership and financial support you have provided to our community and schools, and we look forward to our continued partnership throughout the budget development process. Local Composite Index, or LCI, is the state's measurement of each locality's ability to pay for public education. 
The formula takes into consideration the changes in property values and taxes, the local income and retail sales, and compares it to that for the entire state. Each locality's index is adjusted to maintain an overall statewide local share of 45% and an overall state share of 55%. Much of our funding is derived from a per pupil cost multiplied by one minus the composite index. So the lower the composite index results in more state funding, while a higher composite index would result in less state funding. The LCI is supposed to be an indicator of the wealth of the locality. If it goes up, the locality is deemed to have increased wealth and will be able to provide additional funding to support its programs. The LCI is updated at the start of each biennium, and since our school division serves two localities, we have two LCIs. The City of Williamsburg's is .7217, and James City County's is .5331 for the current biennium. This chart shows a comparison of our LCI with surrounding divisions. As you can see, Williamsburg and James City County have the highest LCI of any locality in our region. Unfortunately, that means fewer state dollars for our schools and an increased dependence on our local funding partners. Enrollment is based on our September 30th student count each year. This is a historical look at our enrollment from fiscal year 2015 until now. We had a steady increase in enrollment through fiscal year 2018, then enrollment leveled off for a couple of years at approximately 11,450 prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. <coughs> we saw a decline in enrollment in fiscal year 21 to 10,858 due to the pandemic, but we've increased for the past two years and are now back up to 11,308. Each year, FutureThink prepares a 10-year enrollment projection based on our September 30th enrollment information. These projections include a low, moderate, most likely, and high projection. Next year's projection ranges from a low of 11,224 to a high of 11,537. And for many years, we have used the low projection to develop our operating budget. Since the pandemic, though, we have developed the budget based on our current year enrollment as of September 30th. Enrollment is slowly recovering after the decline due to the pandemic, and we believe the most conservative approach is to budget based on the students that we currently have. Also, as a reminder, these enrollment numbers do not include preschool students, which total 395 each year. Currently, our state revenue is based on Governor Yunkin's proposed amendments to the 2022-2024 biennial budget and is estimated to go up by approximately $5 million. The information presented does account for the budget calculation tool error that school divisions were notified about the end of January. This error meant a reduction in our state revenue of approximately $1.1 million. Governor Youngkin's proposed budget amendments reflect the most recent estimates of sales tax revenue dedicated to public education. The estimates include both the 1% and the 1/8 percent portion <coughs> that are appropriated for distribution to school divisions based on school age population. It is projected that we will see an increase of 1.1 million in fiscal year 24 related to sales tax. Standards of quality or SQ funds have been updated based on the latest actual ADM and fall membership data. Also included is increased funding to expand the grade levels funded to the fourth and fifth grades for reading specialists. Currently, state funding is one is for one reading specialist per 550 students in grades kindergarten through third grade. Incentive programs will see an increase of approximately $4 million. <coughs> this is primarily due to funding for a 5% compensation supplement effective on July 1st, 2023, as well as a supplemental general fund payment from the state in lieu of the food and hygiene tax. The governor's budget also provides for the state's share of a one-time retention bonus payment for funded SOQ instructional and support positions. Local staff eligible for the bonus payment can be hired at any point during fiscal year 2023, but must also remain employed with the same school division in fiscal year 2024. And 
projected lottery amounts are being used to fund the state's share of various programs, such as the Infrastructure and Operations Per Pupil Fund, Early Reading Intervention, K-3 Primary Class Size Reduction, and SOL Algebra Readiness. We are estimating an increase of approximately 80000 in this area as compared to our fiscal year 23 budget. Overall, we are looking at a total increase in state funding of approximately $5 million, or 8% over our current fiscal year 23 budget. <coughs> in addition to enrollment data, we use the strategic plan to guide the development of the budget and to ensure the budget supports the needs and goals of the school division, taking into consideration the input of our stakeholders. As we go through the presentation and review expenditure increases, those that are considered mandatory, which is a statutory <coughs> or contractually obligated expenditure, are notated with an asterisk. All other expenditures are deemed essential in order to continue to deliver high quality instruction and to sustain division operations at the current level. Starting off with our strategic plans goal one, academic achievement, college and career readiness, Expenditure increases here include our commitment to the New Horizons program, as well as an increase in school-based allocation <coughs> based on an enrollment of 11,308 students. Based on our staffing ratios, to serve 300 additional students, we would need to add a total of 15 FTEs. But you'll see here that the request is 10 FTEs. We've analyzed class sizes at the elementary level, classroom by classroom, and believe we can maintain class sizes with five additional teachers instead of seven, and at the high school level, one position instead of four. This was part of our process to reduce our overall funding request for next year. There are also nine elementary math interventionists and a CTE coordinator transitioning from our ARP grant fund into the operating fund. Goal two of the strategic plan focuses on educational equity. Expenditure increases here are for three special education teaching positions transitioning from our federal Title VI B grant, as well as transitioning the coordinator for student services into the operating fund from our ARP grant, which leads the division's implementation of multi-tier systems of support, or MTSS, across all of our schools. In relation to the three special education teachers that I just referenced, this table shows our federal IDEA 6B grant award amount from 2019 through the current fiscal year, which supports a total of 31 FTEs. As you can see, the amount of funding really hasn't increased from year to year, yet we provide salary increases and benefit costs increase each year. We have reached the point where these federal grant funds cannot continue to sustain the number of positions that we have in the past. We need to transition three teaching positions from 6B grant funds into the operating fund next year. And this graph shows the five-year history of our special education expenditures and the funding source. The light green area of each column represents the amount of federal funding, which is approximately 10%. The dark blue represents the amount of state funding, which is approximately 20%, and the purple represents the amount of local funding each year, which is approximately 70%. You can see again that our federal funding has essentially stayed flat. And while we are transitioning three current positions out of our 6B grant into the operating fund, we actually need additional special education teachers as well as special education aides <coughs> that we plan to fund through our American Rescue Plan grant, again, and in an effort to reduce our funding request for fiscal year 24. These positions will likely need to be funded in the operating budget in fiscal year 25. Ms. Bourgeois, Senior Director of Student Services, will now share data related to special education. Good morning. Good morning. In order to provide context to the special education mandated needs, We'll begin by looking at our special education population trends. The December 1st state reporting document determines the state and federal funding for special education for the next fiscal year. This year's December 1st count showed an increase of 57 students, 
creating an upward trend as compared to the past two years. Our special education caseload requirements are established by the Virginia Standards of Quality. Teacher caseload maximums are determined through a point system, with points assigned based on the specific needs of each student. Looking at this year's data, the number of caseloads that are above SOQ maximum has increased from eight last year to 12 this year, and the number of caseloads at the maximum has increased from 10 last year to 26 this year. These caseload numbers adjust monthly based on revised IEPs requiring increased services as well as transfer or newly eligible students. The trend shows these factors will continue to impact caseload capacity for our teachers. With this increased enrollment, special education staffing needs continue to grow. This year, the equivalent of one FTE was added to support specific reading programs. In addition, during the course of this year, there's been an increase of four paraprofessionals in order to, to remain in compliance with individual student needs that are IEP mandated or required. At this time, Ms. Ewing will continue with the presentation. Safety and security of students and staff remain a priority as seen in goal four. The budget proposal includes three school counselors in order to maintain our staffing ratio of 251, which is the recommended staffing ratio of the National Association of School Counseling. One of these positions is being transitioned from our American Rescue Plan grant. There's a school psychologist position being transitioned from our ARP grant, as well as a new supervisor of safety and emergency management as recommended in our threat vulnerability assessment report received in the spring of 2022. Regarding the additional counselors that I mentioned, this will allow us to maintain the recommended ratio of 250 to 1 set by the American School Counseling Association. Additionally, this supports our ability to meet the Virginia State Code of providing 80% of counselor time in direct services to students. This data supports the request to transition the ARP funded psychologist into the operating fund. This slide shows a comparison of our ratio and FTEs with some like divisions and one neighboring division. With eight psychologists, our ratio is 1,455 to one, which is higher than the other divisions. Without continued funding for this position and only having seven school psychologists, our ratio rises to 1,663 to one. These positions are vital to supporting the mental health of our students. In order to attract and retain high quality employees and remain competitive with neighboring divisions, the division's goal has been to include a salary increase 3% above the level of state funding provided to all divisions for increases. The current public version of the superintendent's proposed budget, which was presented on February 21st, reflects an 8% increase, which is 3% above the governor's proposed budget. At the March 7th school board meeting, the consensus of the board was to change the salary increase from 8% to 10%, reflecting the same competitive 3% increment increase above funds provided by the state, as outlined in the House and Senate budgets. Both of those budgets reflect a 7% salary increase. This is essential in order to keep staff and attract new staff to our division. In order to receive our full revenue allocation from the state, matching the state's allocation is considered mandatory. The additional increment is essential in order to remain competitive in today's job market. Funds are also included within the budget proposal to support a one-time 1% 1 retention bonus to employees as provided for in the governor's budget. It is also recommended that stipends be adjusted by an average 2.5% in order to attract staff to take on these additional duties. And there are also funds allocated for internal equity adjustments to be considered. Additional items under Goal 5 include funds to continue with the higher substitute teacher and nurse pay rates that began in January 2023, as well as funds for minimum pay considerations our minimum pay from $12 an hour to $13.50 an hour. 
Our health insurance increases came in at 9.9%, which is proposed to be split 70% WJCC and 30% employees. When we first began our budget process in January, we were advised that the increase could be as high as 15%. After negotiations, we are happy that it came in just under 10%. Overall, the investment under Goal 5, Human Capital and Positive Culture, amounts to <coughs> $3.7 million, which is essential to attract new staff as well as to retain the dedicated staff that we already have here in WJCC. The most valuable resource the school division has is our employees. These dedicated men and women go above and beyond to serve our students and community every day. The challenge is to continue to hire and retain teachers and staff members of this caliber, which is why compensation is so important. Mr. Tim Baker, Senior Director for Human Resources, will now share more information related to compensation. Good morning. We wanted to begin with the information on the starting salary of our neighboring school divisions for the current bachelor teachers, which is on the left of each grouping with the lighter shade and the progress to the right and 7% for those beginning teachers. In the WJCC scenario, we show in each increasing shade what our salary would become if we were 1%, 2%, or 3% more than our neighboring school divisions. For the current school year, our bachelor's degree entry-level teacher earns $50,000. In this example, those teachers could move to $55,000. As on the previous slide regarding bachelor teachers, this slide shows the impact on the current beginning teachers for master's degree teachers as compared with our neighboring school divisions with the same 1%, 2%, and 3% more than our neighboring school divisions. For the current school year, our master's degree entry-level teacher earns $51,681. In this example, our teachers could move to $56,849 but please know, even with a 3% more increase than Newport News and Hampton, WJCC beginning teachers would still be earning less than Newport News and Hampton. We shared these last two slides as a reminder of where we rank with our key competitors as we prepare to hire and retain teachers for the upcoming year. Virginia school divisions are facing substantial challenges recruiting and retaining qualified teachers. Statewide teacher workforce data shows that more teachers are leaving the profession, while fewer teachers are becoming licensed for the first time. The number of newly licensed teachers for the 2021-2020 school year was 15% below the pre-pandemic average. This year has been like no other in recent memory. We are seeing a new trend this year with teachers resigning and retiring during the school year. Our goal is always to be 100% staffed, and traditionally, we've hit that mark or come very close. Our exhaustive efforts to add staff mid-year, however, is not currently keeping pace with resignations and retirements. This year, we have seen a net increase in our teacher vacancies each month, with a low of 6 in September, 16 in January, and as of today, that number stands at 10. Since September, We've, had, we've hired 25 teachers, but we've had 31 resignations and retirements. Generally, teachers resign or retire at the end of the school year. But with this new pattern, hiring season never stops, and it's creating turmoil in our classrooms. Overall, in Virginia, the number of teachers leaving the profession rose substantially in 2021-2022. The number of teachers leaving the profession was 12% higher than the pre-pandemic average. The growing gap between individuals leaving and entering the teaching workforce helps explain the increased teacher vacancies. Before the pandemic, there were about 800 vacant teacher positions statewide. This increased substantially to 2,800 vacant positions in October of 2021. More recently, the VDOE collected data from 111 school divisions as of August of 2022, and they found there was 3,300 teaching vacancies across those 111 divisions, a 25% increase from the vacancies reported just a year before. 
and this trend is happening in WJCC schools. Our yearly turnover trend mirrors the state of Virginia. After declining during the first part of the pandemic, the number of our teachers leaving rose substantially since 2021-2022, and we are on course for a similar trend this year. We simply must invest in retaining and attracting new talent to WJCC schools. Thank you. Moving on to budgetary expenditures related to Goal 6, organizational efficiency and effectiveness, you will see funding to support anticipated increases in our workers' compensation and general liability insurances, as well as cost increases for our audit and risk management contracts. Specific increases related to operations and transportation under Goal 6 include anticipated increases in our grounds maintenance and storage facility contracts, as well as utilities and fuel, and the transportation contract for alternative transportation services. In an effort to reduce the funding request next year, I do want to mention that we have reduced the amount for utilities by $200,000, and the request for the fleet management system has been reduced by $79,000 related to one-time expenditures that we plan to fund in the current fiscal year. Also related to Goal 6, organizational efficiency, we have estimated savings of just under $1.5 million as represented on this slide. Efficient savings have been increased from 500000 to $1 million, again, in an effort to reduce the funding request. This graphic outlines that our focus is right where it should be, instruction. It represents our expenditures by functional area, and instruction makes up 74% of our total budget. <coughs> In summary, our revenue increase, which is based on the governor's proposed amendments and a small increase in other revenues, is approximately $5.1 million. The expenditure increases after factoring in attrition and other savings amount to approximately $15.7 million, which results in a funding request to the localities of approximately $10.6 million, which is a net increase of 11% over the current fiscal year. Based on the House and Senate budget versions, we could see additional state revenue between $500,000 and $4 million, which would reduce this request. This concludes our formal presentation of the superintendent's modified proposed budget, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So I'd like to open it up to, well, first, if I could ask any board members from the school board if there are any comments that you'd like to include before we open it up to questions and discussion. Ms. Donner. Um, so the weight of what we're talking about here today is not lost on me. There are 17 of us who sit in this room who the decisions that we make impact 11,000 students, 2,000 faculty and staff, and over 100,000 people that live in our combined localities. And <coughs> It's not lost to me as we go through this, looking at a, a deficit of up to $10 million that is put on us as the localities to be able to fund and to come in and asking as a school board for what we think is a budget of need for our students and for our um, faculty and for our communities is really, is really hard. And we are in this position where I believe that all of us are on the same page that we really care about schools, we care about education, we care about uh, creating a community that's attractive, that attracts folks that are, you know, retirees that want to be here, that attracts young people with their change in work, where you don't have to live in a DC or a New York or a Chicago, you can come to a community like this and have a better quality of life for your kids, for your family. And the schools are such a big, important part of that. You know, the schools attract a good school system, attracts having the professionals that we need, the doctors, the lawyers, the folks that are leading companies, the entrepreneurs, because they can come here and their kids can have a really good education. And so I think it's just, we're just in this tough place of how do we create that and look at a huge number. It's a huge number. And I don't think any of us want to walk out of here 
know, after this conversation today or in the, in the conversations that we have to have <laughs> subsequent to this with the populace looking at the 17 of us in this room and saying, wow, they didn't care about education. They didn't care about our students. They didn't care. Because that's not it. We do care. And it's how do we demonstrate what's important to us as a community and what is important to us and what our values are and illuminate that and then also deal with the realities of there's a lot of other places that also need help. And so um, Mr. Hipple maybe will help me with my analogy here around it's a, the way I think about it is that it's a house, right? And so if you have a house, there is things break and you have deferred maintenance on your house, right? And you can decide I'm going to fix that or I'm not going to fix that. And I think as when I'm looking at these, and I'm the newbie here, but as I'm looking at the numbers and where we are, you know, we have done what we can and we have over, you know, I know that the, the um, the county overfunds what the minimum requirement is, right? We've always done a little bit more, um, but it's still like major pieces in the house are starting to fail. And so at some point, you go beyond, you defer the maintenance to the point where you could have structural implications to the home. And so that's where I feel like we're starting to get to where we have done the things where we could patchwork and, and, and try to solve this, but we're at a point where I'm afraid of what could happen if this crumbles. And in looking at the teacher vacancies, again, public, I went to public school K through 12. I never saw a teacher leave mid-year unless someone, you know, had a, a, like a baby, right? But they would always come back. And so it's, as I'm sitting in these board meetings and I'm watching every time we go into closed session, this person resigned mid-year, this person resigned mid-year, and it's school counselors, it's teachers, I mean, it's, it's bus drivers, custodians, but it's people that we really need. And so like that to me is such a huge shift and makes me wonder like what is, what's going on and what's happening? And then you see like look at living in these localities, we're going to share with you some of the testimonies that were shared with us. But you know, there was one story of a teacher, you know, she's new, she has, she's divorced, moved back home because this is a place where lots of people grew up they left and they come back home. And so she's moved back home, got divorced, has two boys in our school system, and her take home pay is about 2100 a month. And her rent is more than half of that. And when I was looking, right, average rent in the city is 1200 in the county is 1250 So now you're left with $900 a month to put gasoline in your car, to feed two growing boys, to put clothing on your back, to put clothing on their back, and she's talking about, she has a second job. She's talking about getting a third job, and she's gonna probably wait tables this summer to make money to make up the deficits. And so when I think about that and I look at, you know, in our locality, master's prepared, um, on average, if you have a master's degree, you make about $61,000 a year. In order to do that as a teacher at WJCC, you would have to have a master's degree and work for 20 years just to get to that median. And so when I look at our ask around the 10% and kind of doing the 3% over what may come out of the General um, Assembly, the way that I think about it is, one, you know, I think you know, all of us work or have worked at some point, and at the end of the day, you want to feel like you did a good job, you're respected on your job, the people you worked with treated you well, and that you were paid, paid fairly. Not paid a lot, not paid you know, astronomical, but just paid fairly. And so that's how I look at it is how do we get our teachers paid fairly where we are starting to, to again, chip away at that our deferred maintenance. So right, the 7% or the 5%, whichever comes out of general assembly, like that keeps us whole. And then that extra 3% starts to chip away at those, at those deficits to make sure that our teachers can stay in this community, that our teachers can contribute, that our teachers can live here and spend their dollars here. And if we're creating a situation where they can and that they leave us, um, that, they, that they are so far behind, it just makes it really challenging. The other thing and the last thing that I'll say before um, I hand it back is that there's a lot of conversation around the 10%, and that's a really important number, but I think the other things that uh, Ms. Ewing and uh, Ms. Bourgeois also talked about is really important is that there's that support staff thing. Because yes, you want to get paid, but it's also the environment in which you're working. And so 
in that budget, there's about $2 million in there, which just keeps us afloat, right? It is providing those that support staff. It's providing the teachers to keep up ratios. When I look at, for me, the school counseling and the psychologist budget, you know, I think about, you know, it is so important if you've got a building where the children t trust the teachers and trust the psychologists and they have the space to be able to get in those classrooms and talk to the kids, right? We can prevent some of the things that have happened in other areas because, right, the teachers can actually understand what's going on at home, what happened at the bus stop, what happened in the neighborhood, and that might be coming into the schools. And if we don't provide that support and to wrap around those teachers, like I'm afraid of what could happen because we don't have enough people in those buildings to make sure <coughs> kids have someone to talk to that are paying attention to our kids and are safe. So I think like, yes, the 10% is kind of the big headline, and it's the, it's the part that creates the most noise. But underneath that, there's just so much in the budget that just makes it a place that's safe for our children, that makes our community safe, and that allows us to shine a bright light on what things are going right here and right in education and attract people to come here and spend their dollars here and build businesses here. And that's where I'm focused on. And so that's why I supported the 10%. So those are my comments. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Dale. Thank you, Ms. Donner. Any other members? Uh, Ms. Hummel. Um, so I, I come from more of a, a business perspective. So uh, as Mrs. Donner said, I'm sensitive to the budget's shortfall between what the state may be offering versus what our community needs to do in order to maintain an excellent school division. And I would like to just offer my kind of a business perspective on why I'm supporting the 10% raise. Uh, we're all operating in an inflationary period of time. I checked the U.S. Congress Joint Economic Committee's report on the CPIU inflation, and we're currently at 6.4% for the month of March from the previous year. So for the majority of Virginians, their personal financial situation is the same or worse than two years ago, especially among the middle class, which tends to be the hardest hit by inflation. This is where our teachers and support staff sit in the stratum of society today. Um, in 2022, 2023, a first year teacher with a bachelor's degree earned $50,000. The 5% raise would increase their salary by 2,500, but the increase in their insurance premiums plus inflation at 6% would negate any positive bottom line to their quality of living. And according to the Virginia Employment Commission, we have a 3.2% unemployment rate, which means our teachers have choices. And as you can tell from Mr. Baker, they can leave the profession, they can go elsewhere for more money and less hassle, and then they never come <coughs> back. So for me, it's a matter of simple economics. It's the law of supply and demand. Nationally and in the state of Virginia, our teachers are leaving the profession. Every year around this time, WJCC administration sends out that survey that Mr. Baker just shared to see who plans to return so they can plan for hiring. And this year, the survey revealed that we are seeing the largest turnover ever, with 148 teachers responding they're leaving our school system, some for good and others to leave to um, join other school systems for, for more money. So they are making a choice to leave because for whatever reason, they're not feeling valued by our school system or our community. If we want our teachers to feel valued as a community, we need to put our money where our mouths are. We need to offer more than a 5 to 7% raise provided by the state, which doesn't even keep them whole from the previous year. It certainly doesn't make our community competitive with some of our neighboring school divisions. So for me, supporting this raise is a value proposition. Do we want to live in a community with a solid and thriving school system that will in turn attract and keep businesses and residents in Williamsburg? Do we want to protect our investments in home values? Do we want to educate and produce high-functioning graduates who will in turn be self-sufficient members of society? Do we want graduates who will support our infrastructure and provide the basic services our community needs in order to have a great quality of life in Williamsburg and James City County? So we have difficult choices ahead of us. I would like us to choose the option that provides the best return on investment for our community. So please support our budget of need for the WJCC school system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Dr. 
beers in Venice, Oregon? Yeah, um, I, I think it's, it, it's really important when you look at those numbers up here to realize that it's critical to not just maintain our number of professional educators, teachers, uh, psychologists, and um, counselors, but also to increase the number of teachers, counselors, and school psychologists. We're in the midst of a uh, mental health crisis all across the country, uh, not just elementary, middle school, and especially high school. There are psychiatric hospitals around the country that have waiting lists, that are, and those institutions are designed um, exclusively to serve children and adolescents. Um, this is, and it is something that is not going to go away immediately. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to maintain um, uh, the teachers around. Uh, we need, we, there, needs, there is a greater need for teachers, for more counselors, for more psychologists to meet this mental health challenge. And one of the ways of meeting it is to provide incentives to stay with us and also to attract other um, people. We have had um, issue, mental health issues in this school division. We are not um, uh, exempt from those kinds of things that, um, that other school districts have, uh, um, have, have had to deal with. Um, and I just, uh, I, can't, I cannot stress too much the real importance of, uh, we just can't maintain status quo. We're gonna have to go beyond that in order to serve our students. Dr. Bears, Ms. Ortega, and then Ms. Young. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time and for, for listening to our um, concerns and our, and our proposal. Um, like my colleagues, I understand the tension that you are all feeling because teachers are not your only municipal employees who understand that. Um, in addition, we, I understand the tension between wanting to meet the very real needs of our teachers and students and exercising the fiscal responsibility that all of us um, rep, uh, owe to the taxpayers we represent in our various capacities. Um, that being said, teachers, along with other municipal employees, are a bedrock of our community. And they are not just um, asking for a raise because they want to get more money for doing the same thing they've always done. I just want to highlight, I know my colleagues have touched on it, but teachers today are, are doing more than just educating. <coughs> They are actually um, one of the schools are one of the main administrators, of, if not the main administrator, of social services that would otherwise fall on other aspects of the, the county or the city. And so we have to keep that in mind that we're not just talking about paying teachers more to teach, we're paying teachers <coughs> and staff more to meet real needs of our community, of our county, and of our city. Um, and you know, this is for better or for worse. Perhaps it's time, looking forward, that we, as leaders, get together and have a conversation about whether or not the schools should be the main administrators of all the social services they're they are they're doing. Um, it's always done out of generosity and genuine care for the students. But this is falling on the backs of teachers and at times at the expense of education. And so that's something that I think all together, looking forward, we might need to talk about. But for today, we have to face that that is the reality that we're dealing with today, especially post-pandemic. Um, and we need to um, come up with a way to alleviate some of that pressure. And it's not just money. We, we, we all know that. And if you talk to teachers, they'll tell you that. It's not just money. Even 20% raise, they're, they're people that, you know, they're, they're breaking because we are expecting too much out of schools. But for today, um, I would say I would urge you help us resolve the shortfall of today and ward off a potential crisis for tomorrow so that it will allow us to gain sure footing to start um, the next school year in a way that will allow us to truly look at the future, create a school division that will allow teachers and students and thus our entire community to truly thrive. Thank you, Ms. Ortego. Ms. Young? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. And good morning, Mr. Dan. It was good to have you with us at Berkeley the other day. Um, we're here this morning, we're, we're bringing a big ask to you, and we know that. But many of the years that I've taught school, this, this is the budget season comes around and, and things are um, 
as always this and they always include teacher salaries um, and the salaries of teachers are usually determined by this body or um, I worked in areas where there was a board referendum I mean a bond referendum that went out and uh, as a teacher sometimes I was asked to go knock on doors or make phone calls to make sure it passed uh, that's that's another big ask for a person who's busy with kids um, as a board member I've always found it interesting that we have to come hat in hand we do not fund our own schools uh, this is a cap I'm sorry I didn't have a hat but we come hat in hand and we ask for your support um, and we've been very fortunate you as um, our funding partners have been amazing in supporting our schools and we want to continue that but this year it's a little bit different uh, last year, for example, we gave a 7% raise um, to our teachers. And I don't know about you, but I was really thrilled about that. I thought that was wonderful. But then it, just shortly after that, when things started uh, coming to light about what the inflation rate was, I'm on, I have Social Security. This year, I received an 8.7% raise. And at the same time, that was pretty much what was, that was uh, what the cost of living had increased by. And, and so those people that were retirees um, received that, but our teachers didn't. Our teachers were still at the 7%. And if I can remind you, uh, there was a period of time, last October, November, gas was $5 a gallon. Many of our teachers, uh, I think approximately 15% of our teachers, live outside of this, the city and county, they had to drive here, $5 a gallon. Uh, Many of the other increases that we're seeing is because it not only was just regular gas $5 a gallon, but I saw as I drove, I, I have uh, children I go visit, there were places where diesel was 6 and $7 a gallon, and that's one of the reasons we're seeing the huge inflation in our stores. Uh, recently, I, somebody told me that they, I don't eat eggs, but they told me they were at the store, they, that eggs were $5 a dozen. That is supposed to be one of the cheapest forms of protein that you can provide for your family. Five dollars for a dozen of eggs, that, that's, uh, that's outlandish. Six dollars for a pound of hamburger, that's a lot of money to ask a family to come up with. We have been fortunate that we have been able to provide for our teachers thus far, but one of the things that I want to point out to you, that many of our teachers are not just working in our schools. They are working part-time in other professions. You heard Ms. Donner talk about a teacher that, that has another job, and she also works during the summer. Many of our teachers supplement their income by, by taking um, after-school activities, working in the athletic area of our schools to get a stipend to help them. And I'm sure that Ms., uh, Mrs. Huntley is going to talk about a lot of that. But one of the things that I that came out this week is we were told about a $59,000 is the median salary of our teachers, $59,000. So I went back and I did some research and I wanted to see what happens if you're a teacher and you're in our school system, how long does it take you to reach that median? Well, um, I know you know that teachers have to maintain a licensure, but if you decide to not go any further than a bachelor's degree, it takes 21 years to receive, to get to the median price of $59,000. If you have a master's degree, it takes 18 years to get to that level. And if you have a master's plus 30, it takes 14 years. I see some of your looks, you're kind of astonished. That's good, because that's, that's not a, a good statement to make about where our teachers are as far as pay. Um, one of the things that our teachers have, they have a 10-month contract which is divided into 12 equal monthly payments. Our beginning teachers get $50,000 a year this, uh, this right now, and that was the payment this year. I wanna remind you that there's a lovely little thing called taxes, and I think every one of us in the room is subjected to them. Uh, our teachers fall into the 15% federal tax raise. I think almost all of them do. Um, if you are a beginning teacher and you start with uh, Pay, um, scale of $4,166 a month, which is what happens if you take that $50,000 and divide it by 12. You can get out your calculator if you want to follow these figures. Um, after that, you get a 15% off of that automatically. And that 
brings down your pay to three thousand five hundred and forty one dollars and then there's another little tax that we don't like i just like to talk about the state tax i often forget about that um but that's a 5.75 percent tax that's the range where most of our teachers would fall into that brings their initial basic pay down to three thousand three hundred and sixty one dollars that's before anything else and many of our teachers are also uh, paying for uh, health insurance and then there are always other things that's before lodging food gas for a car possibly a car payment and for many of our young teachers if not most of them a student loan so we're asking an awful lot of our young people and i remember a few years ago um, the uh, person who was president of the local uh, union here came and she uh, she was a new year to first year first or second year teacher and she was talking about some of the struggles she was ha having first of all paying for a decent place to live and yes we have places in Williamsburg where you can live for five hundred dollars a month but I don't think any of us in this room would want to live there so as a member of the school board today, I just want to remind you that we are mandated to present to you a, a budget of need. Our budget of need represents a 10% increase for our teachers. It's, it's a hard sell, and I understand that. But as a member of the school board, I fully support it, and I'm asking you to support it also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Ms. Sundley? Good morning, everyone. I might come today to in support of the 10% raise. And I thought about what can I say that you haven't already heard or what's going to resonate. And I know that I can tell my story. And I don't know if Mr. McGlennon, you were on the board 18 years ago, uh, or supervisor, but I was that teacher that brought her nine month old on one hip and her three and a half year old by the hand. And I begged for a raise for two days. Um, I remember that day vividly. I think I even bought silly pudding or something asking you all to stretch, <laughs> try to find a way. Um, I came, and I don't mind putting this out there, married to a teacher who was working at WCA because there was no tech positions here in Williamsburg. Two children, child care bills out the roof, car payments, student loans, and on the verge of bankruptcy. My saving grace was salary scale at the time. You could get your bachelor's, bachelor's was 15, you got a little raise. Bachelor's 30, little raise. Master's, get another raise. Master's 30. And then finally, I, I went all those steps, took a few of the little stipend positions like minority achievement leader, team leader, those helped. And then instead of doctorate, I went the national board certification range. And then also longevity stipend. That's gone for teachers now. Those little bits of raises, you know, used to pay 80%, now they pay 50 Jack so that you can get, uh, take classes, the two classes. So that's what saved me. And teachers aren't, the long day is gone, we're not going to do that dead for um, Now it's just master's plus 30, and then you just go into doctorate. So all those little steps and raises are gone. I, as you know, am not far removed from the classroom. And I have a pulse on education right now. I'm, I try to get into all the buildings. I try to spread all the wonderful things. I was just with Miss Ramsey um, at JBB yesterday, and she knows we ask the questions. We want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I have a pulse. If, if you take a pulse with three fingers, I have six on it. And in our elementary schools right now, they're having to deal with things I've never thought they would have to deal with. And one thing is discipline, K and one. And I'm not going to share all of the, uh, I'm not going to share the ugly today. I'm here to, 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 but our teachers are having to deal with things from the pandemic and, and other things that just, I just, sometimes I just can't believe it. I, I saw these cute little bands on kids and I thought they were watches and they're tracking devices for kids that are runners to keep them safe. Um, right now there's a, a, a group of students that are getting ready to learn about Greece and Rome and they have to go through all the textbooks because the Statue of David is naked in some of them or you have the fig leaf in others and you have to let parents know there may be nudity now and 
No, we're not going to. You know. So these are just some of the stressors. Let's move to middle school. Man, I had to, last night I went there. I didn't want to. I didn't know what a vape looked like, y'all. I didn't know what they're talking about, about some cartridges have CBD oil, some have this, some have that, some have apps that tell you when to suck it in. Where do you, where do you get them? I mean, they're off the top of my head, there are five vape stores. I've just drove around, there are five. Um, I'm sure there are more. One across from a middle school, and we have students that are struggling with that. Again, I'm not going to get into the ugly. So I'm, I'm just praying, like, nothing's going to get in one of those vapes that a child ODs on, like fentanyl or something. <laughs> Um, let's tax those vape stores, you know, that are just popping up everywhere. And then let's move to, to high school. We have drugs, alcohol, and all kinds of stuff, and fights, and discipline there, too, as well, and cell phones. Oh, my goodness, cell phones. Um, that's, you know, and, and, and to get back to the positive, that's why I go to the track all the sporting events, the fine arts events, the AXO events, because there are children, that's, that saves a lot of our children, those things. And I want to, I just want to know that our children are doing well in the midst of all that the teachers are having to deal with. And then the attendance. We got more kids that want to be influencers on something to get money than be influenced. They have more of a, they could be a doctor, a lawyer, anything before they're going to, you know, whatever the influencers do, I don't even know because I'm not tech savvy like that. And it breaks my heart. And I'm not even here to talk about all the things that teachers have to do now that they've never had to do before. And I will say this as a wife of a teacher, I've never had an argument with my husband until this month because I feel like a horse trainer. I make him put those blinders on. He, he worked at WCA. Don't look at the carrot they're dangling over there about they're an IB school now, and they've got um, international students coming in, and they're going to have a diverse staff. He taught in, in York County for five years. Don't look over there at York County. And he's saying things like, well, he used to take kids as a CTE teacher to competitions that we don't, that he hasn't done since there's no resources here. Don't look there. I'm the only, um, there's two black people, I'm, I'm one of two black males at my school, he says. I'm like, you don't know what's over in York County. You may still be one of two black. You may still, you know, ha they may not have a better health packet than we do. You just stay focused on kids. You just went to an event where you found out your family was on a reservation and the Naval Weapon Unit came in with and move them off and you moved into Highland Park and some of your family moved into Grove. You, you were born and planted here. You're going to stay here with your kids. You're going to put those blinders on. I don't mind reading the little thing that I have to read when budget comes up about, about you know, I can make a fair judgment on the budget. What I don't want, it's not going to be a good look for me, is to have Tim Baker reading that my husband is going to another division. That's, I, that is not what I want. So I told him, this is what you're going to do. You're going to do what you do well. You're going to go to Hornsby. You're going to make a difference for those children. You're going to come home. I'm going to have dinner ready. You're going to watch your ESPN while you're eating. And then you're going to your part-time job, which he has, teaching golf. And anytime I hear anybody mention they need a golf instructor, I'm going to take your little golf cards out. And I'm going to say, my husband's an excellent teacher. He's also an excellent golf instructor. We can't afford to buy back the five years that he lost at WCA so that he can retire in three years and not eight. I want to stay here. I want, I, this ask is for the kids. Because if we don't have teachers, y'all, all those wonderful things that I post and we all post on social media, if we don't have teachers, those kids are not going to have, what are we going to do? I'm very scared. I've never been a scared woman. I am very scared. We got to come off some pennies, one or two cents. We got to do something. Or we're going to be in. I feel like the Titanic. You know, some people are willing to go down on the ship, but some people are going to jump to save themselves. And what I hear from teachers and staff is they feel like they're drowning. I don't know if any of you have ever ha felt that. But I'll share this last thing. I went to Cancun. I had a life jacket on. And I was, had all the highest intentions to go snorkeling. 
and that choppy water and where I had to go, I panicked. And that's what's happening. People, our people cannot solve some of this thing. They're panicking. And that man came over with a little round thing, and he says, I can't hang out here with you. I have these other people to take care of. Can you make it? And I said, I cannot make it there. And he said, I'm going to blow the whistle, and a boat's coming to get you. And he blew the whistle, and someone came and got me and took me to safety. These teachers are blowing the whistle, and nobody's coming. The resources, the funds, everything they need for support is not coming. And they're, they're just treading water keeping their head above water. It's like an iceberg, 10% looks good, but that 90% underneath is just, and so this is very important. And that's why I stand behind the 10%. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Sunley. Uh, and I appreciate um, the attentiveness of the, the room as we offered uh, time and space for our school board members to share their <laughs> unique perspectives on uh, the superintendent's modified proposed budget. Um, I, I recognize we're we're short on time, but I definitely want to hear from the room on your questions and concerns as you might offer those to Dr. Heron or, or her staff. Well, I'll just kick it off. I, you know, certainly appreciate Dr. Heron's uh, modification, modified budget pr proposal today, and, and certainly all of you on school board, the work that you do, um, you know, at your meetings and going to visit the classrooms and, and really putting your heart and soul in, in all your energies into providing great quality education for our students um, and the children of our community. And I think everyone around the table uh, feels the same way. We, we, want our, we want to have the best school division, um, you know, produce the best children, uh, whether they go to college or and find a career, or whatever it is, um, it's better for the community in general. And so I think we all support um, the initiative here. Um, so thank you for that. Good question. When we talk about 10% or the 10 million that additional that you're seeking, would that money go directly to teacher raises or would it be a raise across the board? You know, with that man and you know, everybody. It's currently a raise across the board. That's what the cost involves. Okay. Mayor Ponce. Chairman Hamilton. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's I want to thank the school board for all your hard work and every decision you make is not going to be the right one just like with us and you know we just do our best to hope we make the right decisions um and and, and we in james city county and i know Williamsburg as well know how dedicated y'all are and how much you support the children which we appreciate very much because i still have two children in the school system 30 plus years of having children in the school system and and we've had great teachers and um, <clears throat> just like we are with with our staff you know we've got a lot of great staff and uh, we've got to look at the the 100 percent I know y'all looking at your 100 percent which is the schools we've got to look at that and everything else we have going on as well and all of our other staff in James City County that that take care of us and deserve raises and and to me there's not one person more important than another. And I've had teachers come into our meetings and and have been very wonderful on, on supporting what they see is coming on with the schools and that sort. When several years when um, um, Mr. Hill was here, we found we had an issue with the fire department. We were losing firefighters, just like you're losing teachers. Between year eight and year 14, and we figured out, we said, well, all right, what do we need to do to address this? We were spending overtime, people were getting burned out. They were, they were just leaving. They said, you know what, I'm not getting any more money. I'm not getting this. I'm not. And so we addressed that situation and we didn't do it across the board. We didn't go, okay, Parks and Rec is gonna get this and, and the fire department gets that, the police gets this. That. We said, we have an issue, which y'all have, teachers. So we had an issue, we took care of that. Next we found out, same thing the police department and so we started looking at police department why are we losing police officers well they're losing police officers and firefighters all across this nation just like teachers i don't know what's going on with this country and what's happened and and what caused these issues i think covid scared a lot of people which i can't blame that was a, a big thing and but it's changed the way we do business 
and now everybody's competing and I'll give you 10 cent more, I'll give you 10 cent more, I'll give you this. Eventually that's gonna have to stop because it's, it's no way you can continue that. During our um, meeting, our last meeting Tuesday, and I even made mention to a couple of the board members, the teachers came in, they were concerned about the money, but there was a deeper concern and I could hear it. And it was, yes, we want more money. Yes, we need more money, like all of us. I mean, I'd love to give our board a raise and, and, um, and all of our employees a raise and the teachers a raise and everything else, but we're limited the amount of money we have. But there was something else in there. It was, we had one, so, several of them say, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this class and I get moved over, I got to teach this class and I'm moved over, I got to teach this class. And then I've got special needs students that I'm taking <coughs> care of and I can't take care of that because I'm being put over here. So there's a, there's a, there's a deeper issue I feel that maybe this board may have to look into deeper. What are these, what, what is all, pay is one thing and I agree with that, but what are the other issues that are going on? You know, not everybody's leaving because of pay. And it may be a benefit, it may be a frustration. You know, this has always been a premier school. And um, I know when we moved here in um, <clears throat> 76, and we bought, Dad bought the land in 61, but we actually moved in the house in 76, the school system wasn't really that great. But the nice thing about the school system is it was small enough that all of us, regardless of where we lived in the community, were pretty much in one or two classes and definitely high school together. And a lot of us still remember those high school days and, and it was unique. Now we got three different high schools and they think differently and they kind of compete against each other, which I don't know why. But there's an underlying, I'm seeing an underlying something going on with our teachers. And it could be nationally. It couldn't be, and I'm not saying it's James City County's issue. It could be something that's greater than all the teachers, but I think that needs to be investigated. Um, you know, once our county administrator puts out the budget and, and there's X amount, and of course we give to the schools every year, we give more than it's required to give, and we want to do that. We support good schools. Can we go to the top of the line? I got it. just to be honest with you and I get criticism because a lot of times I'm just straightforward honest and people are like oh, I can't believe you don't support I do support you but there's a limited amount of funds that I can support you with now will I try to push it as far as I can with the board and all yes and and this board is always ever since I've been on the board willing to support the school system and try to make ways and try to go, okay, we can do this, we can do that, let's fund this. And, and the county administrator has been very good about that and talking with Dr. Herring and, okay, how can we do this? What can we do? How can we move this? So we'll always continue to do that. But can we get to those numbers? I don't know until that comes out. But if we can't get to those numbers, then this board is just like our board. We've got to take, you fit basically 50% of our budget, 47 by the time you get to state tax, which we changed several years ago, you're around 50, 52%. So let's just say 50 for easy figuring. We'll take our 50 on our side and our board will sit down with the county administrator and say, okay, what raises can we do? What can we spend? What can we not? This, this may end up being the CIP may have to go out two more years so we can do this. And it's going to be the same thing I ask I'll have of this board is when we do have that funds, if this board will meet with your superintendent and go, okay, now we've got to figure out how we can do that. And I know on our board, you may have to push a project back or something to give a raise to the teachers, but we request that, that with the money we can give you, you put as much into the teacher raises as you possibly can. And I think that would help out a lot you know, and, and we'll support you as much as we can, but once we turn that money over, of course, we don't have a say on it, y'all do. And which is the way it should be. Y'all should be able to say what you do and how you spend your money. But we request on our board, and I'm sure the city, that you put as much in the money we can supply you with into teacher raises that you possibly can. Thank you. 
you sir thank you chairman when you're absolutely right there are certainly many other stressors that's points within the division watching teachers staff or faculty that we are aware of you're absolutely right it's not just wage increases that's going to solve that issue um here and now or even in the future um and we're looking at all of it so absolutely i appreciate your perspective any other comments or questions uh i had a i just had a question um ms ewing said that you could possibly get 500 to 4 million um that's a that's quite a stretch wondered if you could expand on that a little bit sure so in the house version of the budget it would be about five hundred thousand in additional revenue um again it includes a seven percent salary increase um and it takes out a one percent retention bonus that i spoke about that's included in the governor's proposal so the house version really essentially is the seven percent salary increase and then on the senate version it's actually a little over four million um again it's a seven percent salary increase but it also includes um elimination of the cap on state funding for support staff um so that's the larger um, amount that provides that additional state funding so we're hopeful that they come to a meeting of the minds and we get somewhere in between those um Thank you. That that's very helpful. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I'm a bit frustrated to be honest because I what what I'm hearing is you all have to do this when truly you get your budget and and you have to have to allocate it as you see fit. We could, <laughs> you know, there are some localities in Virginia where Board of Supervisors do allocate per budget line. I don't think, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not interested in that, and I'm pretty sure you're not. I, I know I wouldn't have been if I had been sitting in your spot. So, you know, in fairness to me, I won't even say to us, we're in the second year of a two-year budget um, where our county administrator said, you know, a year ago, the increase was going to be 1.4 percent. I understand we're in unprecedented times for a lot of reasons, um, but that it's a big ask past 1 percent. And Mr. Stevens has has told Dr. Heron we're, we're going to go above that. But we, as Ms. Humble pointed out, where we are from two years ago, please know. We are looking at the very same thing with our employees. We had a retreat last week where we had department heads that are steel and have been that were breaking down over the frustration of not being able to retain employees, of training them and then having them leave for the next best thing, somebody offering a dollar more an hour. And they're worn out. They're in the same spot. And so we also have stressors of our own that any type of increase that we see, we have to address as well. So it's not not wanting, you know, it, it to get pinged with not wanting to support education, I don't feel is really fair and realizing that life isn't fair because we have, you know, one look at that um, chart, you know, we can't compare to Newport, Newport News is getting a whole lot more state funding than we are. We give 104% more than we're asked to do, our citizens do. So we do support education. How we go forth is something that we, we will all have to struggle with, but to put all of the responsibility in our lap, I'm gonna put a little bit of that responsibility back on you because as Mr. Hipple pointed out, we've had to make tough decisions that haven't always gone over when we have had to raise police or fire and not been able to raise everybody. That may be a position that you find yourselves in where you have to make it, do we raise our teachers and we not give the very top and the very bottom as much, that may be something that you have to wrestle with. 
but that's what we've had to wrestle with as well. I have great empathy. I am, I've sat where you've sat. Um, I know I have friends that are teachers. I, my kids, my gosh, the education that we got through WJCC, I'm so grateful for. Um, it is obviously not just a local issue, it is a national issue. As I have said from my seat on the dais, what we did back in, you know, when, when, the, the, um, when the economy um, took a downward turn, we, as a locality, said we put that on the backs of our public service workers, our teachers, our county workers, we didn't raise taxes. Other localities around us did. We asked them to not take a raise during that time. I think we're seeing the result of that. We ask the same people all the time to take it. And we may be asking that again um, in some ways, but we are trying. And we are, we are not sticking with our 1.4, which was what we were originally. We'll have to wrestle with what that is. But, um, you know, we just want you to understand that we are facing some of the same challenges. Thank you, Ms. Larson. That is appreciated on this end. And just to um, address uh, the frustration, I think, that um, you shared, and I think is, is met with some other members uh, in, the, in the room, um, that uh, I would say much of um, the talking points around the allocation of what is asked for in that large number is really just a, a measure of accountability to those our funding partners in the room. So just as a, as a sign of respect that um, these dollars will be treated with genuine care. Any other comments or, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the school board for um, your willingness to, to come forward. As it's been said, it's a, it's a difficult ask. Uh, more importantly, that the work that you've put into um, obviously, the comments that you made today and sharing personal stories. Um, and, you know, as, as Ms. Ortigo first touched on it and then Mr. Hipple, um, unfortunately, I, I agree that 10% that is not going to stop um, the issues they're facing. Teachers are facing all these outside stressors. Um, and so maybe, it, you know, how we, how we solve that. Um, obviously, I'm not an educator, so how you solve that, I don't have an answer to. Um, but I, I want to share a personal story. Um, as the father of an educator, not in this school system, she calls mom or dad <laughs> three to four times a week on her way home from work to just to vent because of all the, all the stressors that are taking place in the classroom um, and outside the classroom. Um, and you try to be supportive, um, but you're also concerned about their their mental health and their, their safety as well. Um, so I have I have a firsthand experience <laughs> listening to um, an educator um, who's who's um, facing all those challenges in the school system today. And I do agree, as as Ms. Donner pointed out, a, a quality educational system is vital to both of our communities. Um, and, and I certainly support that and I support our teachers and um, I, I don't think I could, I don't think I could deal with the things that they have to deal with. Um, you know, fortunately, I, I have positive comments. We um, had a tour of, of Berkeley Middle School this week and uh, very impressed with the things that they're doing, the, the conduct of the students, um, how they're helping uh, students that are in need. Um, you know, from hygiene items to clothing, um, that's just take, they've taken on, the staff has taken on as a personal challenge um, to make sure that these kids don't have another reason not to show up for school. Um, so I know their, their heart and soul is in it, um, but most of all, just wanna say thank you for um, what you do for the, for the school system and Dr. Heron and her staff, and again, coming forward and, and making the big ask. Uh, um, Sadler, and then we'll hear from Ms. Wiggland. Thank you. I just want to reiterate um, what my colleagues have been saying, that we appreciate everything that you do for the students. I've not heard um, one, uh, not one person say that they didn't support teachers and teachers' assistants and bus drivers. I think we're all 
saying the same thing and the question still remains how do they get compensated and taken care of we do our best to provide what we can but as my other colleagues stated we have other departments who are struggling as well so we have to look at that as a big picture on how we're going to solve these problems countywide citywide across the board so we have a lot of that that we have to take into consideration but thank you again for everything that you do for our community and for the kids and again we i, I, I would say that i could speak for my colleagues that we all support teachers and their assistants and bus drivers and hope that you can find a way to make sure that their needs are met um, in, in a proper way when you're doing your allocations. Thank you. Ms. Sadler, we do have the room for five more minutes. Mr. McLennan? <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, purposely indicate that to me? That? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you wouldn't take a few no, minutes. No, 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 I understand. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me, let me thank uh, uh, all of you on the school board and the school administration. Uh, it, it is really uh, uh, very inspiring to hear the commitment that you have to providing excellent education for our students. and. For to address what is, you know, not just a local problem, it is a national problem. Uh, uh, my wife retired after, uh, in her 40th year of teaching uh, not long ago, and uh, uh, I know the stresses that she faced every single day. Uh, again, not in this school system, but in, in a different, uh, uh, in the Newport News system. Uh, and uh, um, she, she, she constantly tells me, I got a letter, you know, I, uh, asking me to come back, and I, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's no question that there is a tremendous amount of commitment to doing the very best for our, our students. Uh, just to, to share a little bit of our frustration, um, when we hear uh, news that uh, this, both the House and the Senate uh, have decided to increase uh, salaries uh, uh, by um, two percent uh, from from the five percent that was in the original budget to seven percent. Uh, we all cheer and say that's great, and then we recognize that we'll cover two thirds of those additional two percent. Uh, and before we do anything else, we have to find that money uh, uh, to be able to to provide the full raise that the the state is um, uh, offering. And I know our, our legislators are, are sympathetic to that concern and they're trying to do what they can. And so I, I certainly hope that of all the things that are in the proposed uh, budget to, um, uh, negotiations right now, that removing that cap from support positions uh, has got to, to be uh, critically important because we're paying 100% of the costs of those positions right now. Uh, and uh, that's a, a, a place where we could really get some state help. Uh, <coughs> I did have a, 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 and so I will say that, you know, I, I'm absolutely certain that my colleagues, we, we may have uh, different places that will land on what we think we can do, uh, but uh, there's no question that we are, on the one hand, absolutely committed to finding as much money as we can to address the needs of our school system, just as we need to find those resources to make sure that our citizens feel safe. Uh, from a public safety perspective, that they have the opportunities to live in a high quality community with parks and recreation facilities that offer, offer daycare uh, facilities as well for working parents. We need to be con uh, uh, compassionate about the fact that, uh, like everyone else, our taxpayers are experiencing that increased cost of living. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's uh, um, a limit to the degree to which we can think about some of those issues. Um, so, I, um, I, I think we all share frustration. Uh, wish we could just write that check and say everything is fine. Uh, but I can say that, that I think there is every evidence that, that uh, uh, there is good faith on both sides, or on all three sides of this table. Uh, and uh, that we. I just had a couple of quick questions for you, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, I note uh, that the state has fixed. Uh, the uh, issue uh, <laughs> relating to the sales tax, uh, and that would add $1.1 million back uh, in, to, uh, to our system. But that's, that's a one-year fix, I believe. Is that, is that right? There's no permanent fix to the um, uh, elimination of, uh, uh, of the grocery tax from uh, the sales tax for education. 
That's correct. Basically, it's they've provided the money in this current year, but they have not provided any money for the miscalculation in the next year's budget. So we're, we're over a million dollars short from what we thought we were getting from the state. Uh, that has not been fixed at this point. And so that's something that we have to think about as we're considering next year's budget, for instance, that uh, will we actually, will the state fix that on a more permanent basis? Will they find a dedicated source of revenue to replace that $1.1 million at, at, which should be escalating over time, in fact? Uh, 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 and I, I would just wonder about, about um, this incentive program uh, where I understand that there are bonuses to be given in, in differential amounts depending on whether you are uh, classified as a uh, you know an exceptional contributor a contributor or not a contributor that, is that right they're about a million dollars I don't believe the bonus program is moving forward that we're aware of but of course there's no final decisions yet there is a a one percent bonus in the governor's budget yes um, which like a one percent of a custodial staff member's salary is, is, is not a lot. It's not like giving a thousand dollar bonus. And we're not really in support of that. We would rather that money go into a permanent increase in salary across the board. Right. Well, yeah, and, and I would agree entirely with that. And, and again, about 680,000 of that million dollars would have come from local sources, I, th I think. Is that right? Uh, so, uh, uh, and again, uh, thank you very much for sharing the information. Thank you for, you know, uh, sending the message to the community about what, uh, what we need. Uh, Ms. Donner, uh, um, I, everybody shared such, such um, uh, important uh, uh, information and, and experience. <coughs> Ms. Donner raised a question for Mr. Hippel about deferred maintenance. Uh, I kind of live at my house sometimes and, and recognize those <laughs> issues. Uh, and I also recognize that sometimes we have to figure out a way to address those deferred maintenance items over a couple of years. Um, I hope if we're not able to get to where everybody would like us to be at the end of this year, that we are thinking about how we address this uh, um, Concern on a systematic level to get to where we need to be in a sh in a relatively short period of time. Thank you, Thank you Mr. McGlynn. I'm going to take a pause to look for any other speakers before I turn over to Dr. Heron for final comments. Just one final comment that you know there's been a lot said in the room today, but we are at a pivotal moment in time and a crucial moment in time for our public schools. And we appreciate that, that it's a difficult time for, for all three bodies, but we would really sincerely and deeply ask you to consider schools and make them a priority this year in the budget because we are at a critical moment in time for public education, and I just want everyone in the room to realize that as we leave the room. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. And thank you all for spending your morning here, just, uh, hearing these discussions, seeing this presentation as you go back to your board meetings and deliberate on how you will support public education as you always have. So thank you so much. With that, I want to uh, adjourn this meeting of the school board. I move the uh, city of Williamsburg <coughs> council adjourn. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Here. Mr. Ramsey. Aye. Mr. Chair Dent. Aye. Motion to Aye. adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn until 1 p.m. on March 28, 2023, for the business. Moved. Roll call, please. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr.